Hi, I'm Daniel Mullen, and you're watching Purebred Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. G'day guys and welcome to the Pure Red Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. I'm your host Ellis Gelios, joined in the studio by Christo Adams, a uh, regular contributor to Pure Red Reds and of course from the Red Army, Chris Hadel, man. Good mate, cheers for having me back. Always welcome in this place. Um, now, just before we get into everything, um, huge weekend last weekend. Tell us about how the march went firstly, because uh, you had a bit to do with the uh, organising of all this. So, um, a fantastic um, like day of events put on by the Red Army, the march, um, the capoing as well, which you took part in. Um, how was all that? Yeah, it was a it was a brilliant game. Um, with all the all the events, as you mentioned, that happened before the game and then during the game that weren't related to on field. I thought it was um, a highlight of the Red Army so far this season, uh, apart from the FA Cup final, which was our, our best yeah. so far. Um, our March, we had good numbers, and I was absolutely privileged to have been allowed to capo or co-capo alongside a couple of other people, and so it was just a generally very fun day and. Really great to get the win as well. Absolutely, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, but we are here to preview the game on Sunday afternoon against Wellington Phoenix, mate. So it's a 5.30 kickoff this Sunday at Cooper Stadium. The match can be seen live on Fox Sports and the KO Sports app as always. Um, no big squad changes. Ben Harlan in is the only significant one. Um, and uh, also Lockie Brook was promoted as well, but there's going to be two to three omissions. So you'd expect that uh, it's likely Lockie Brook might be omitted, but hopefully not because I really want to see some more of him. Um, anyhow, let's first touch on last weekend's incredible display against the victory. Last Saturday night, 3-1 win. Um, that was second best all day. Return of Kurz, obviously, um, you know, was the storyline going into it. Um, what a performance, what a result. You obviously uh, were capoing and might have missed a few moments here or there, I suspect. But uh, anyhow, how did you see it? Well, just to address that, I was lucky to see all three goals with my own eyes, not Fantastic. through the TV. But it was a comprehensive win from us. I, we were basically just controlling the game. I, don't, I haven't seen in my lifetime us control Melbourne victory like that in a full 90 minutes. And just not be scared at all about like not getting a result. Because I've got to say, even when they equalised, it was probably the first time ever where I didn't just bury my face in my hands and think, geez, they've got the momentum now, they might actually come back. Yeah. Because I usually feel that way against victory. But I just felt like, no, nah, we've been the better team all day and I don't know seriously think that they're going to come back and mount any kind of challenge here. They were, they were dreadful in the first half and they, uh, from watching the match replay, uh, they did start the second half with a bit of bit of positivity and a little bit more possession than us. Yeah. But um, I, I agree with you in the sense that when we equalised, um, there's obviously that emotion where um, no, we, we're 1-1 now, we're associated with it, but I didn't feel as though, okay, now we're going to go and, and lose. And 14 seconds after kickoff, we went and took the lead again, which was ooh, that I, I can't. That got the spectacular thing. That, that was fourteen passes incredible. in the lead up as well. It was, it was just a brilliant team move. But then um, you have to question Victory's setup from that well, from that kickoff. They were everywhere. They were chasing shadows and deservedly because yeah. it just looked like they were spineless all evening. And, uh, and they deserve the result they got. But uh, let's not talk about victory. We're here to talk about us, of course. Um, so, a couple of did you knows before we deep dive. So, we hold a massive 11 game undefeated run against Wellington. The last time we lost was back in November of 2015. Um, and coincidentally, we've won our last four straight A-League games. And the last time that happened was in that same season that we last lost to Wellington, a little later on in March of that campaign, when we went on to ultimately achieve the unthinkable, as we know, and win the championship. And I don't want to like tempt fate, but um, you know, that kind of, uh, it's been an interesting. I didn't quite put all that together before uh, reading those facts. So anyhow, another one, who would have thought also that Wellington hold the best tackle percentage in the A-League currently, going at 64%. What do you make of that? That tackle percentage is probably 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 flatters them to be honest. It does because like you you watch them play and they don't have like an 
overbearing amount of physical players. It's not the Wellington of 10 years ago. Mm. They're much more of a ball playing side these days, um, you know, even post Rudin. I think it definitely flatters them. Um, they, they aren't really that physical side that they were, say, 10 years ago. Um, even though they have, you know, Stephen Taylor in, in defence. And I just, overall, I, I don't think they've been quite quite poor this season, regardless mm. of if you overlook their results. I, I watched a few of the games. I think they've been playing decent enough football. Absolutely, yeah. Um, they took it to Melbourne City and they got their first win against Brisbane last week. Even unlucky at victory, I think. I, I definitely agree, yeah. yeah. Um, they're, they're, they're a weird... A weird side, I think, at the moment. Mm. Um, and I don't think this is a game that should be underestimated because no. they they have some decent players. They have their their uh, Mexican number ten, and um, they've got uh, Gary Hooper yeah. up forward. Who I'm not has, sure if he's going to be fit, but yeah, yeah, I, I believe he missed last game. Yeah, but he has a definitely has a reputation and. I just I, I don't want to I don't want to underestimate them. We'll get into that because uh, that's one of the key components of the uh, of the preview here that we've got. So um, it is a potential danger game as you've just highlighted. Um, we know how good we've been, but Wellington's results haven't been entirely indicative of how they play um, across many of the games so far this season, and uh, they're entering entering this clash significantly off the back of their first win. So they're going to be up and about. We know that. As a fact, now, um, what doesn't um, favour them going into this game is their horrendous record at Cooper Stadium. It's one of the worst away records any team has throughout the history of the A-League. Um, personally, I haven't seen many losses to Wellington over 15 years of, of going and watching the games against them at Cooper Stadium. Um, so that definitely does not weigh in their favour at all. But nevertheless, it's a danger game. We have to agree with that, don't we? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I believe the last time we lost to Wellington was in was in uh, 2014, December. I might be wrong. So I, I've only in my lifetime I've only seen them Adelaide United lose at home to Wellington once. Yeah, it was that night. It is quite quite an outstanding record that we have against them uh, at home, and we we drew nil all to them um, last season, but also absolutely blew them away. 3-1 in the first half with a quite a good first half performance until Stanislavopoulos was sent off. And as, as I mentioned, this is, a, this is a danger game, but I don't want us to treat it as a danger game. I want us to tr go in and play our football, yeah, don't let it play our style, and not let that hover, sort of hang over our heads. Totally. In the fact that they're a decent side, they haven't had results, but you know what you know what you can get out of them at the moment. Absolutely, yeah, no question about it. Um, now, pundits and observers of the A League are now becoming fixated on how good our midfield is. I want to discuss Luis Rigo. Um, so he's playing in the easiest role currently, and he's in brilliant form. How long is it until we can start to genuinely label him as an adequate Isaias replacement? Because it feels as though, despite how commendable everyone's been towards him, he's still only expected to be a stopgap for Bowen until the German becomes fit again, which, uh, as we found out yesterday, is going to be within a month from now. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I, I've been very impressed with Louis Diarigo's performances. He's, he's playing ahead of his age for an 18-year-old. You'd think that he's had much more experience than he actually has. Uh, I was really impressed with his performance against Victory. Perhaps if we go early season, maybe against Sydney FC, it was, it was quite literally his debut in the A-League, or his starting debut, so mm -hmm. you can excuse him for taking a little bit of time to get himself into it. But compared to other youngsters that we've seen play in the past, uh, Di Rigo has really impressed me, and he started the move that led to our first goal against Victory was quite a stunning switch to Ryan Strain. And if he continues this, this form going into the next couple of couple of months, Boland could come back, but we could be looking at a situation where why would we play Boland ahead of Diarigo if he's performing that SAS role to perfection? What what's the point in starting Boland even though he has all the experience if you've got this if you've got the form that he's in right now? I personally if we had Boland fit I, I wouldn't start him ahead of Diarigo right now. Do you think what might come into Verbeek's mind is a bit more of a long-term consideration because of the fact that Boland hasn't had the happiest of times as of the past six or so months? Um, 
I wouldn't have thought it's likely he'll be here next season mm. based on how things are going for him right now. Um, he's, you know, 31, I think. Um, so he's not the youngest of players either. Louis de Rig, on the other hand, is an 18-year-old or 19. Um, got a massive ceiling in fantastic form. It's not long before he starts grabbing the attention of clubs potentially overseas, at least Asia, I'd, mm. I'd speculate, um, because of obviously the fact that he's considered as an Asian player, playing um, in those bigger leagues in Asia. Um, surely the fact that we might actually be able to cash in on Louis, which sounds strange to suggest right now because he's only just come into the team, but you know, if he starts, if he, if he continues to play as well as he is, and we obviously uh, continue to be as good as we have been as a collective and finish strongly this season, you'd assume that he's, you know, probably going to be in, putting himself on the shop front. He wouldn't be on a huge contract, wouldn't be earning a great deal. Um, so you'd think if he can keep this form up, the club gives him an improved contract and can then on-sell him for quite a handy fee, that would be, you know, something that maybe is a directive being passed down to the bank. Or is it just about the week to week? What's going to benefit the team the most? What do you reckon? Um, I don't think we should be getting ahead of ourselves. Looking at the fact that he is still 18 and has had limited experience. But you're, you're right to ask that question because if he continues playing like this, looking at it in a long-term perspective, I, I could definitely see him there, there being interest because it was the exact same situation as Riley McGree was in 2016-17. Correct. He just burst upon the scene. All of a sudden, nobody had even heard of him before he started putting in brilliant performances week in, week out, and then at the end of the season, he was off. On a bumper deal. I, I, think that, I think that's actually something that me personally, I don't like to see because Riley McGree, you could probably argue that he went too early and perhaps wasted a period of his career. Um, bouncing around Club Bruges, and he had a, he had a successful spell at Newcastle Jets, but couldn't say the same for Melbourne City. It was quite limited at Melbourne City, but um, I think Diarigo needs to make sure that he focuses on his own performances. That's what you want to see, and in, in young players, especially given you know with with youth form dips and it goes up and down. So he he needs to just look at look at making sure that he's steadily improving. And I'd hope that he would overlook the, the plaudits that he's receiving at the moment from the media and from the fans, because that's a similar thing. You know, we, we want it with Al Hassan Toure. We don't want him to get, let it all go to his head because that's when you, sure. you'll see it start to, he'll, his form start to drop. Um, Diorigo is extremely impressive, as we've discussed, and I could see down the track it happening, yeah. him, him eventually going. But at the moment, I don't think it should be, I think it's hap it's, it should be addressed, but I don't think it should progress, that discussion should really progress any further than it is right now, if you know what I mean. Totally, a very wise breakdown indeed. Um, anyhow, we press on. So with Ben Halloran back in contention, how does the bake line up, Chris? There's so many options, um, and given he made those changes to the team last week, um, there's sure to be serious competition given that it paid off so magnificently well against Melbourne Victory. Um, so, yeah, getting into our starting 11 right now, there's headaches there for the bake, no question about it, um, both defensively and offensively. With everyone fit, Bar Boland, um, who, you know, shouldn't really be around the conversation right now anyway, as we've just previously highlighted with Dorigo playing so well. How should the bake line up? I wouldn't mind seeing Ben Halloran comes straight into the team, but that's just a question more about his fitness levels yeah. because we know that it was a minor hip problem that he had last week and for Bates said in a press conference, the only reason why he didn't make the team sheet is because he didn't train on Thursday. Yeah, so that, that was precautionary. That was, that's a precautionary thing for a minor issue. Um, it's, it's a different situation comparing Opseth and Toure. Because I personally would continue to play Opseth. I've yeah, been he's very been impressed. really good, hasn't he? Very last impressed two games, last two games, yeah. And just on Halloran as well, we've got to mention he was great against the Mariners. Oh, he that was, was one of the best games I've seen him play for Adelaide United. And so, personally, I wouldn't want to see him not start because then he might enter another one of those sort of mini dips that he goes on here and there. Um, so, yeah, provided his fit, I think he should definitely be in starting contention. Anyhow, um, continue with 
who you think should be starting for us? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I personally, unless, uh, as I mentioned, he's got a fitness issue, Halloran should probably be starting. He's We've seen him this season in the best form of his Adelaide United career. Um, goal scoring wise, he's been getting assists as well. Um, his game against the Mariners, as you mentioned, was was quite spectacular. Mm. And I just, I was, I'm just been thinking, you know, where's this Ben Halloran been for the past season? Um, I feel he was he was wasted uh, as a as a midfield player or a centre centre forward player under Marco Kurtz last season, and now we've been seeing him utilised properly and we've been really getting the best out of him. So I, unless he's unless he's unfit, I don't see why we shouldn't shouldn't start him. Fair call. Uh, defensively, don't change anything. No need to. I don't think there's any need to change anything. Um, we we saw two weeks ago, Jakobsen went off with a, a back spasm, and you could you would have thought maybe that provides a chance for Jordan Elsie to come mm. back into the team. Ultimately, Jakobsen was still selected, and I think riding on our defensive performance last week, there's there's no, no real need to change it. We saw uh, Michael Moroni come out and give a press conference during the week, quizzed on uh, you know why we've been so good, what um, the manager has been saying at, at half time, because uh, we've been really good in a lot of second halves throughout the season, um, and that was again on show against victory. Um, for me, I think he, it's kind of undersold how well Moroni's done for us at centre-back. Like, it's not his natural position. He's only become a centre-back as of the past two or so seasons. Um, and I just feel like there's this chorus of people who are expecting that the bank will keep Moroni in the team so long as no mistakes happen. And then as soon as there's an injury somewhere or there's a form lapse, Elzy comes straight back in. Do you think that's how it's going to roll out? Because right now, I think Moroni has done everything to deserve retaining his place in the starting eleven. I'd, I'd hope, I'd hope that Moroni keeps um, keeps being played because he's he's a little older and a little wiser now. You know, he doesn't have the, the sort of speed that he would have a few years ago. For sure, yeah. And I think he's apart from his height. He's he's really suited to centre back, and he's really he's really impressed me. I, I don't see any reason why Elsie should be starting ahead of him. Like you know, with all due respect, to Elsie is a very good player. He should he should be having to earn that spot back. Definitely, there. definitely. And Moroni has done everything apart from he gave away a penalty against Mariners, but that's really sort of nitpicking. And yeah. If we look at the overall picture, he's been more than solid. Um, he's played played a huge part in in winning the FFA Cup from centre back. I thought he was absolutely brilliant against Melbourne Victory. Again, um, last season, funnily enough, against Melbourne Victory, he played centre half. Yeah, it was great then. And too. he was great mm. then. So, Moroni's been really turning up for the big games from centre half, and that's what that's what you really want to see if somebody if he's up for it, which he quite clearly is. You know, he's he's not he's not saying. Okay, I'm maybe starting to get towards that period where it's almost the end of my career. It's it's not a let's wrap things up type thing. It's mm -hmm. a I'm I'm going to continue going at it until I physically can't, which is which is absolutely brilliant, brilliant to see. And I, I just don't unless there's a, as you mentioned a real form stuff, and I'm saying like a significant form stuff to the point where it's. It's affecting on almost like when the bake is therefore just forced to make the change. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Uh, unless he's forced to, yeah. I don't see why Maroney should be should be being dropped because at the moment that back four looks completely it's settled. Completely and settled. I therefore have to ask you, uh, Maria at left back. What a revelation! Um, he's been. He was uh, playing at left wing against the Mariners a fortnight ago. Left back against the victory. Still very productive going forward as well and uh, had one of his be best games for us probably against Melbourne. Um, your thoughts? I, I wouldn't call it one of his best games to be honest with you. Just I, he, was, he was at fault for Toivonen's goal because he, he'd le he left him. But I, I, I can't sort of blame Strain a bit more for that one. Um, I thought Strain got beaten way too easily by, by, Robbie, by Cruz. Robbie Cruz. Yeah, and that was like Cruz's first involvement. A fair, yeah, very fair call. Um, but yeah, it, uh, Pretty much, it's it's you know you could look at it either way. Fourteen seconds after kickoff, though, Marine made amends, which is yeah. <laughs> that's probably why I'm looking at uh, the Toivonen goal through some rose tinted glasses. If, if we're okay, looking at it from the perspective of what he offers us going forward, I haven't seen as as he, good he adds attacking. more value than Kido. as good an attacking fullback in the side and um, Elrich when in our championship season or 2014-15. Goodwin 15-16. 
He, Gooding in 2015 16 only really played left back for the last sort of quarter of the season, though. Yeah. So if, still good, though. Still, well, still fantastic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> but uh, he's, he, seemed, he seemed quite like, he, like he's up for it. And it's taken a little while because he's played like five different positions for us already. I think he's played left wing, right wing, central midfield. Oh, yeah. Right back against He's, he's almost like our lead Broxham, but better. And then left back. Yeah. So. That's quite that's quite incredible versatility. Totally. Uh, left back seems to be the position for him though, and as long as he is, as long as he's either providing something in attack, mm. or making sure that he's not getting caught out of position in, in left back, because for Bates shouted him a few times, I've noticed from the side. I was about to bring that up for for that. He's been getting a real bake. Yeah. From the bake. And I actually don't think that's a bad thing. I will look at the positives there because that means I, I see it as Verbeek is making sure that everybody everybody is doing their best to improve. Mm. And I think Maria is a, he's a young player himself. I think he's only like 22 years old. And if we can see him improve or continue to improve, then well, we might have an absolute a gem on our hands with here. Totally, man. Um, there's no question about any of those things whatsoever. I also just wanted to bring up on Maria one reason why I've been so taken aback and impressed by this uh, fella is the fact that um, I'm hearing he's, uh, he's had a few hints at um, the fact that the Curacao international manager might want to utilize him at some point, and he's actually said, you know what? The journey's too much, and I'm not interested. I'd rather just commit fully to my club right now, so leave me alone. Um, and if that's the case, mate, what a legend. If that's the case, then yeah, I, that really warms my heart almost. Absolutely. Um, so, given all those things, Chris, uh, before I ask what your favorite Wellington memory is, prediction for the game. I, I can't, if we're on form, I can't see us losing. I, I, I think it'd be a, Two or three nil game for us. There should be no excuse unless we have injuries or some Which we don't think we're some coming, yeah. ridiculous circumstance that prevents us from hitting our, our best. Mate, stranger things have happened in football. Stranger things have happened. Plenty of stranger I, things. I agree, but just looking at our our form coming into this game and Wellington's Wellington's form regardless of the fact that they're still quite a decent side we, we've played better side and yeah we've played better sides and, and won so look it should be it should be no excuses so win win and to us yeah by how many and who's two, scoring two or three nil I, I I could see I could see um Halloran if he's if he's in the team scoring or or upset to be honest does Nicola bounce back from last week I didn't think he was uh, particularly great against victory at all um, probably his worst game this season um, do you think he might bounce back uh, I'd say I'd say the worst thing to do would be to take Nicola out of the team so if we just keep him in there he'll he'll find his form again I didn't think he was too bad but I, I agree one his one is wasn't his best game but this season as a whole I think Nicola's also been quite good yeah and I, I'd say that's just attributed to the attacking style that we've been playing. So totally, um, I'd, I'd like to see Nicola hopefully regain. I wouldn't say regain his scoring touch because he's not like he's in a drought or anything. But it, it would be a good game for him to hit the hit the net with a goal. No question about it, mate. Now uh, I want to hear your favourite Wellington Phoenix memory, uh, particularly at Cooper Stadium. So which is it? Yeah, my I'd say my favourite Wellington memory would be. My first game that I went to watching, oh, not it's like my first game seeing Wellington play at Highmarsh Stadium. It was yeah. back in 2012-13, and we won 3-1. Correct. Uh, Marcelo Karuska scored an in, or was supposedly an indirect free kick. There was a bit of controversy around that, um, and it was the, the absolute highlight of that game was Eugene Galakovic's famous double penalty or double save from a, a penalty at the end. Tyler Boyd took it. Went worldwide. Saved, saved the first yeah. um, first shot and then the rebound as well, which was spectacular to watch. Famous person. moment. Yeah, very famous moment. Went viral. Daniel Garb, Fox Sports, played it to Joe Hart all the way in England. I, I remember, yeah. Joe Hart was commenting on it. It sounds a bit strange to reference Joe Hart because he hasn't been the greatest goalkeeper as of late, but uh, definitely at that time he was in the whole, you know, up and coming England golden generation mm. conversation. Um, so yeah, props to Eugene, great memory. Um, I'd have to say mine is four years prior, 
when uh, Cassio played left wing, uh, which wasn't his favourite position, and he scored a brace, cracking brace. Can't remember the score, I think it was 3-0. Um, but I'm not entirely sure, I'd have to go back and check the record books. But uh, Cass scored two, and uh, it, was, it was a spectacular night all the way back in 2008, just before we went on that Asian run in the Champions League, which uh, obviously we will never forget. Chrissy, Red Army-wise, uh, anything going on at the Brompton before game? Yeah, just um, we haven't got anything special planned at the moment. We'll be releasing details about our family fun day, family-friendly fun day in the next couple of months. But until then, make sure you're at the Brompton pre-game. And if you want to be in the Bay at our home matches, make sure you buy Home Support Active through Ticketek. Red Army was absolutely pumping Ian's victory. Uh, what a colourful side it was. Um, brilliant stuff. And again, we uh, encourage every supporter that uh, thinks they have something to offer in the active uh, support end to get involved ASAP. Don't be intimidated by anyone. Um, it's a great family friendly environment. Absolutely. And uh, one of the best across the league, really, I think. Uh, I hear problems going on at all other clubs when it comes to active support and disagreements and all that. But uh, when it comes to the Red Army, it seems like it's just seamless. Other than that, Chrissy, thanks for coming in the studio, mate. Up the Reds. Yep, thank you very much, Harry. It's an absolute pleasure, mate. Beautiful. Um, guys, make sure you like and share the page. Don't forget Sunday's game, 5.30 kickoff at Cooper Stadium. Uh, let's get behind the team and hope that we can continue this fantastic form run. Yeah, come on you Reds. All the best guys, thanks a lot for watching, cheers.